So we're looking at 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 8 and going through to verse 22. And in my Bible, this is subtitled Christian Conduct. Pardon? Chapter 3, yeah. 1 Peter 3. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensure it, ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer the righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as evil doers, they may be ashamed of that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer well for doing, than for evil doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was, a prepare, was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not putting it away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. And may the Lord add this re blessing to this reading of his word. How then? Do we behave as Christians? There's a lot in there. Basically, and I don't want to upset too many people, but I'm bound to, it doesn't necessarily mean being a nice guy. It does mean being kind. It does mean being honest. It does mean speaking in the love of Christ. But it doesn't mean being deceitful to make other people feel better or to get what you want. It means putting other people before yourself. It means speaking the truth in Christ, which is to speak the truth in love, because God so loved the world. I expect most of you when you came here tonight were expecting a conversation, a discourse, if you will, on Christ's death and resurrection, on how the spilling of the blood and the water washed away our sins. And I would have to agree, but it's something that's done to death. In fact, Bishop Ryle, and I can't let a Sunday go by without quoting the good bishop, would turn around and say, unless you mention the death and the resurrection and the spilling of the blood and the water, it's not a sermon at all. But today, I want to look at us. I want to hold a mirror up to us. We few, we faithful few. I want to be 
specific about the events on that day and what we should do about it. Many people will go, but you're remembering a day when Christ is not alive, he's ascended into heaven. That's the first error that they make. Christ is alive. He lives forever. He's outside of time and space. He is with the eternal Father. He is not dead. People have this thing that they seem to forget that he came back from, uh, back from the dead. And then even when he ascended into heaven, they seem to think somewhere along the line he's died. And no, he's still alive. He's still very much active. Because it's God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yes, Christ is not with us physically, but he arranged for the Comforter to come. And when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. And when our sins are forgiven and we stand before the throne of grace, God is pleased to pardon us and look at him. And he couldn't do that if he wasn't alive. And they get this view that Jesus is dead because, of course, other great tradition religious leaders are dead. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. The leaders of the various Hindu traditions are dead doesn't matter the way you look at it, they're dead. They were born, they lived, and they died. End of story. And for all of those before the time of Christ, except for one or two notable exceptions in the Bible, people were born, people lived, people died. But what has been going through my mind for the last few weeks now is this. What about those who are alive in Christ? What about we who are behind? How about we who are saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and alive? How do we behave? How do you act in public? We read great stories in the Bible. Book of Acts. There's a couple of not so great stories in there. But we read in the book of Acts how the apostles first around went around telling about Jesus Christ. Healing people. And just saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The question that is again and again repeated. What must I do to be saved? Believe, sometimes you just get believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes you actually get baptised and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to vary depending on what the condition is. And in this reading we see that baptism isn't to wash away our filthiness, according to this reading, you know, it's to show a good mind to God that we are physically saying to God, we wash away our old person, here is our new person, that's what it seems to be saying. If we want to know how we do conduct ourselves, find out how and what we do let's have a look at the word of God what, what is this what is this book what's this precious book this is more precious than ivory and dearer than life itself many hundreds of people have died for it it's our rule of faith and conduct through our lives it tells us everything we need to know we take a detailed look at it. We take a scant look at what the world does. Then if we think we should do what the world does, 
We need to test what the Word says we are to do against what the Word of God says we are to do. And only if the Word aligns with the Word of God do we fall into step with the world. If the world does not align with this world of the will of God, then we have to be out of step in the world. Because this is more important that we fear for our very souls and we fear God. Fear in that sense is to go, we love God more than anything else. We, 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 it's not to be afraid of him, it's to love him more. But we fear for our souls if we do fall into step with the world. So when you get those conditions that we are in at the moment, when the world is saying what that the Bible is wrong and the world is right, if we agree with all of that, then we are out of step with what God says. And if you're out of step without God, with what God says, there is a grave danger that you will fall and commit that one unpardonable sin which is to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because if you fall out of step with what God says, are you really saying, well, I don't believe in God anyway? And that is the only unpardonable sin. It's a total disbelief in God. There is no coming back from it. You may well have declared for Christ, but was your declaration real? You may well have repented of your sins, but was your repentance truthful? You may well have been baptised in a church and be, had your, be made wet with water. You may well have taken communion. You may well have done all sorts of stuff. But if you start saying that the word of God is wrong and the world is right, was any of that real? There is a reality in this world which is of the devil. Christ faced that reality when he did his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and then he came out and he was challenged by the devil. And the devil offered him everything the devil could offer him. And how did Christ defeat the devil? Three times he responded with the same answer or the same beginning of the answer. He wrote, he said, sorry, it is written. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. It is written. How many of you, and I ask this question of myself, if I was to be met with something that I knew was against the word of God, would respond with, it is written. Maybe it's a, it's a practice we ought to pick up. Maybe it's something we ought to say when we get into an argument, especially about the matters of faith. And we know what the Bible says, or in fact you can look it up because most of us have a, it's, it's like a ticker tape going through the mind, isn't it? You know, you get these phrases appearing and you go, yeah, that's in the Bible, I just can't remember where. And you can go, it is written because you look it up and go, there it is in the book. It tends to stop most arguments. It really does turn to stop most arguments. So the opening here in verse 8 is wonderful. And it's how Christians should react to other believers. And I think not only other believers, but the world in general, have compassion. Love your brethren and sisters, which is a phrase that only belongs to the church. Have pity on people. Being pitiful isn't for you, about you being pitiful. It's about having to have pity. Be courteous. Be polite. Don't seek revenge. Don't use hard and abusive language against people in anger. In fact, do the opposite to all of those. Bless those who hate you. Bless those that rail against you. Do good to those that despise you. Anybody getting the feeling of Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes here? It is the truth of living out the gospel. The world will hate us, but we are not to return hate for hate. We are to return hate with love. Now we know that very few will follow that message, but keep it in mind. 
In verse 12, we actually read, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So if we do follow that teaching from Matthew 5, which we call the Beatitudes, then God's listening to you. And he's pleased to listen to you because you're following his teaching. But for those who go against, then his face is against them because they do evil. Verse 15 tells us to sanctify God in our heart. How many of you sanctify God in your heart? That's a way to treat God as sacred. What does it mean to sanctify God in your heart? It means to hold God high. It means to not want to do anything that you would be afraid for God to know you're doing. Ask yourself, I am going to do X. If God was to see me like this, would I be happy? It's like that thing when you were a kid, you know, and you'd, you'd be under the bedclothes reading your book with the torch. And your mum would come in and go, are you asleep? And you'd go, yes, and just carry on reading. You didn't want your mum to find you under the, under the, you know, under the, the sheets with the torch reading the book. The same thing with God. If God was to look at you when you're doing an act or you're saying something or you're listening to something or you're watching something, would you be ashamed? It doesn't matter how small it is, it doesn't matter whether how big it is, the question is, what would God think about you? God is always with us. That's the promise of Christ's death and resurrection. And we will have to be able to give answer to every man and woman and child that asks about our hope. People know what I do. Do people know you come here? Do you get asked why? Can you give a satisfactory answer? Can you talk about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ? I come to church because I love God. I come to this church because I believe this church is where God wants me to be. All those years ago, some 20 years now, I think it was, when John Dalton was alive, and I walked through that door for the first time, and it was like, yeah, I'm home. There were six people, so probably about the same number we've got now. But this is where God wanted me, and this is where I've been ever since. Not just always up here either. I have actually been in, in the pew for a fair amount of those years. And it's interesting that God, when the, the speaker that was scheduled never came, never arrived, John used to come up to me and go, can you give us a word? And I always had a word. I actually had two, three or four words. Um, sometimes I had 25 minutes and 45 minutes of words, but that's another story altogether. But because this is where God wanted it to me, and because I felt this is the place God wanted me to be, and because I love God, and I love God's word, and I believe in talking about the word of God, God blessed me. It wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy. And it didn't get easier as time went on. It's only, you know, I've had to realise quite a few things. But I'm still here, and I still feel it's the right place for me to be. And I see nothing from God to say, time to move. That's the hope. There is hope that I am serving God and not myself. That's the hope while you're here. The hope that you're serving God and not yourself. But it's also a hope based on Jesus Christ. It's a hope that your sins were nailed to a cross and covered in blood and water. That's the reason for our hope, in our meekness and in our reverence to God 
and to God's, God's word. That is why when they speak evil to us, we can be confident that we can give a good conversation in Christ and promote Christ to the world. Because uh, against their evil, glorifying God and shaming the devil and his servants. And what do I mean by that? You will get called all sorts for coming to church. I have been in my years. You know, it's, a, it's a, the nicest thing I was called was stupid. I've been called worse than that. But I've always been able to give. This is where God wants me to be on Sunday. And this is where I get draw my strength to do the reading that I read. And this is where I draw my strength to do the preparation that I prepare. It's this place. And I'm not saying other churches aren't like this place for different people. Other churches would be, or should be, their church should be the same. It should be like a big electrical conduit where there's a plug. And as you walk in here, you plug yourself in and your, your, your faith gets a boost charging your phone. You know, find a plug, put your phone in, you leave here and you suddenly find that your phone's all right for another day. And if you go to a church where the gospel is preached, where Christ is raised, where the hope and salvation that is found in the washing of the sins away by the blood and the water, if where, where Christ rose again to prove to you that you too will live eternity, not like those poor souls that died without knowing Christ, you too will get that charge. And you can feed on Christ and on God by faith with thanksgiving. Which enables you to go out and face the world again for another week. And don't worry if you can't get to church. Because God's taking care of that. You have your portable recharging unit. That's what this is. It's a portable recharging unit. You can read for yourselves. You can delve into it as much or as little as you want until you feel satisfied and sated. Verse 18 is the halfway point. It tells us clearly that Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death and the flesh be quickened in the spirit. And I say to you this night, all who have accepted Christ as your Saviour in being baptised in the blood of the Lamb, we have put the world of sin and flesh to death. And our spirit is quickened. We are no longer of this world. We are just travellers walking on a narrow road. It is a narrow road. We trip. We make mistakes. We fall, as one set of phrases put it, we're travelling in the wilderness. We have a long and difficult journey, like the children of Israel of old. And we are bitten and stung by snakes and adders, and our skin is torn by briar and bramble. And we make great and mighty falls. But if we continue in that hope, that is Christ Jesus, we will one day make it to the end of the road. We'll cross over Jordan into the land flowing with milk and honey. As the old hymn puts it, Courage, brother, do not stumble, though your path is dark as night. Weave a star to guide the humble, trust in God and do the right. Today, of all days, we rejoice that just as God elected eight to be saved in the days of Noah by resting in the ark, just as God rescued his elect people of Israel in the days of Moses and Aaron and gave them the means of salvation in the ark, we can be confident that the only begotten Son of God came to save the elect of God's people without number and acting as the ark of salvation. By his death for his sins, sorry, by his death for our sins and rose again from the grave, defeating death. As the first fruit and evidence that none of God's people will die, then we can face the world with hope 
that is beyond hope for normal man. Rejoice! Indeed, I say again, rejoice. Death has been defeated for all who believe. The barrier has been broken, the table topped, and we have nothing to fear, no matter what the world throws at us. In short, while we remember that Last Supper, the great love feast instigated by Christ, we do this as a memorial, and only a memorial. The bread remains bread at all times. The juice remains juice at all times. But as a symbol of God's love for his creation, they mean so much more to us who trust in Christ and truly in spirit. We feed on him with thanksgiving of the great deed he did that he and he alone won against us for that great enemy. And that great enemy was death. Amen. <laughs>